tremendous truth uh, from God's word that, that Pat has read to us about our identity in Jesus Christ. And uh, I just uh, am so thankful uh, to be able to gather with you, to, to sit under the, the teaching of God's word. And um, I just want to pray again right now. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that uh, the Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God, and He is the only one who can illumine the Word of God to our hearts and minds. And I pray this morning as we look at a lifestyle that is so qualitatively different than the life that is being lived on this planet, that your Spirit would open our eyes to the, to the wonder of the life of heaven, to the wonder of the life of Jesus, and that our hearts would be irresistibly drawn uh, to live this way. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, there are probably, if you could boil it down, two major principles of living the Christian life. Uh, the first is forgiving, which we talked about last week, and the second is giving. Uh, we're going to look at just one verse this morning. And the subject of the verse is on giving. And what we have before us is probably the, the supreme single verse on giving in the Scripture. Uh, giving is the subject of Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Uh, it contains a, a graphic principle. And let, let me show it to you. First of all, here's what it says uh, in Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken, shaken together, and running over, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. There is in this verse, if you can see it, the picture of a grain harvest. And it's not just a, a harvest, but, but it's an abundant harvest. Someone has, has reaped an abundant harvest here. It says, they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and, and running over. Now, as you consider the imagery of a, a harvest, the, the essential act that one must perform to receive a harvest is to plant a seed. And what Jesus is saying here is that giving, giving is, is like planting a seed. He says, give, and it shall be given to you. If you plant uh, the seed of a gift, you'll reap the harvest of, of gifts in return. In verses uh, 37 and 38, Jesus is teaching his own version of the law of the harvest, this, this great law, folks, that concerns every single one of us, the law of sowing and reaping. Just as there are, are physical laws that govern the function of the physical universe, so God has established and ordained moral and spiritual laws to govern the actions of men. And the, the law of sowing and reaping is just one of those laws. And the folks, I got to tell you, the failure to understand this law has left many a man in its tragic wake. We, we have been learning in the study of the Sermon on the Mount about the life of heaven. The Sermon on the Mount is an exposition of the life of the family of God. It is a life that is qualitatively, quantitatively, truly different than the life that is being lived on this earth. There, there is a kind of life that will lead a man to heaven. There's a kind of life that will lead a man to hell. And we could mark the distinction between the life of heaven and the life of hell in this statement, heaven gives, hell grabs. Heaven gives to others, hell grabs for itself. All of our actions at any point are either fleshly or spiritual, either, either designed one to grab or two to give. Now, uh, that does not mean that the flesh does not give. Sometimes the flesh can be extravagant, in its giving and its sacrifice, but the difference between fleshly giving and spiritual giving is that all fleshly giving comes with a price tag, with an expectation. It's not so with spiritual giving that we're talking about here this morning. All of our actions, everything that we do is either designed to 
uh, get or to give. And there, there is a sense in which, we, to understand this, this morning, all of our actions, everything that we do every day, are like seeds that are planted. And those seeds are, are governed by the law of the harvest. And, and what I want to do this morning is go through quickly four laws of the harvest uh, so that we can understand this. Law number one of the harvest is this. We reap what we sow. When you plant an apple seed, you get an apple tree. I mean, the, the harvest is different, but it is of the same quality, the same kind. They are both apple. The seed is apple. The tree is apple. Look at uh, Luke 6.37 and see that, that the Lord Jesus is teaching this principle. We reap the same kind that we plant. In verse 37, he says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. In other words, plant... If you, in your life, a non-judgmental spirit, and back from the Lord, you'll receive a non-judgmental attitude. Uh, plant no condemnation. Plant a forgiving spirit, and you'll get that back from the Lord. You, you're going to reap what you sow. Uh, in Job, this is all over the scripture, by the way. In Job 4, verse 8, it says, According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who, str who sow trouble do what? They harvest trouble. <laughs> you sow trouble, you harvest trouble. Psalm 18, verse 25, uh, with the kind Lord, thou dost show thyself kind. You plant kindness, you get kindness back. There, there is a, a sense in which life has a boomerang-like quality. What, what you throw out is what comes back to you. Uh, there's a very real sense which, in which the Lord uh, made the universe on the plan of a circle. It says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, it is he, God, who sits above the, the circle of the earth. The, the world, listen, folks, need to understand this. The world and all of its happenings operate on a circle and not a straight line. Uh, a man by the name of DeWitt Talmadge makes the following observation. He says, good and evil come back to us. God made the universe on the plan of a circle. According to Isaiah 40, 22, we ourselves start the circle of good or bad actions, and it will come around to us again. Surely, apart from divine intervention, it is hindered. You guys have heard this expression before, what goes around, comes around. That's what he's talking about here. Those, those bad and good actions may make the circuit of many years, but come back to us, they will, as certainly as God sits upon the circle of the earth. Um, tremendous, stupendous thought here that the good or evil that we start today will come back to us eventually. We, we will reap what we sow. Everything that we do is launched on a circle, on a track that will one day come right back to us. Talmadge says this, do, uh, do you know that the judgment day, we talk about the judgment day often here, the judgment day will only be the point at which the circle joins. The good and the bad we have done come back to us unless divine intervention hinders, and coming back to us, we will welcome either the delight of the good that we've sown or the curse of the evil that we've sown. This, this is Talmadge's way of expressing uh, you reap what you sow. This, this law is, is clearly taught in the scripture. Look at Galatians 6 verse 7 uh, where Paul says there, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Here's the law, whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. You, you can't plant a thorn bush and, and expect to get an orange tree. You can't plant unforgiveness and bitterness and expect to get back forgiveness. The, the word of God says, don't be deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he, he will reap. And in verse 8, he says this, for whoever sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. 
but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You say, well, Bill, what, what does it mean to sow to the flesh? I like John Stott's explanation. He says, every time, listen to this, here's what it means to sow to the flesh, to sow bad seed. Every time we allow our mind to harbor a grudge, to nurse a grievance, to entertain an impure fancy, to wallow in self-pity, we're sowing to the flesh. Every time we linger in bad company whose ingredients, uh, whose insidious influence uh, we know we can't resist, every time we lie in bed when we ought to be up praying, every time we read or watch pornographic literature, every time we take a risk that strains our self-control, we are sowing to the flesh. That's what it means to sow seeds to the flesh, and from those seeds, a man will, will reap corruption. But the, the flip side is also true. The one who sows to the Spirit, the one who is responding to the Spirit's impulses in his life, is going to reap eternal life. Folks, law number one, we reap what we sow. Here's law number two. We reap more than we sow. Uh, the harvest is not equal to the seed which produces it. Uh, it is far greater. From one peach seed uh, can produce a peach tree from which hundreds and over the lifetime of the tree, maybe thousands of peaches can be produced. It, it is the principle in Luke 6, 38, where Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. How much, Jesus? If you give one, will God give you one back? No. He says, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God gives way more blessing in response to the seeds that we sow in righteousness. But at the same time, he will bring forth a greater harvest of trouble upon those who have planted seeds of corruption. This law applies to the wicked. It says to the wicked in Hosea, Chapter 8, verse 7, for they sow to the wind evil, and they will reap the whirlwind. Ultimately, those who sow seeds of selfishness will reap the, the whirlwind of an eternal separation from God and eternal hell. We reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow. Here's the third thing. We reap later than we sow. You, you cannot harvest a crop at the same time that you plant. Harvesting always follows a season of planting and growth. And Jesus taught this. Look at Mark chapter 4, 26 through 29. It says, And he, Jesus, was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. He's sowing. And he goes to bed at night, and he gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows how he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First, the blade, and then a little bit later, the head, then the mature grain in the head, and when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. What, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying it takes time for things to grow. It does, but it will grow. And in God's economy, reaping is always later, later than planting, but reaping, folks, is sure to come. It is absolutely certain to come. But you will reap either the consequences of an ungodly lifestyle or the blessings of a godly one. And it is so important for us to remember this, this, this law in the Christian life. We, we need to learn to wait on the Lord. Uh, plant now and wait on the Lord. The harvest will come. It will surely come in eternity. But we can also often experience the joy of the harvest now. I, I think often of parents in this context who are sowing into the lives of their children. Time, discipline, discipline again, discipline again, love, reading the word, correction. And it's hard. And sometimes you don't see much fruit. They're just as bad today as they were yesterday, you know? And, 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 but one day, one day the harvest will come and the harvest will be far greater in your mind than the seed that is sown. The outcome of our sowing will ultimately be experienced in the harvest of heaven, but we can get foretastes of it right now. 
What, what a tremendous truth this is, folks, that we reap later than we sow. Look at Galatians 6, 9, the next verse in Galatians. It says, and let us not lose heart in doing good, uh, planting seeds, for in due time, it takes time, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. This is saying, don't give up in planting. Uh, if you don't see immediate results, we, we, so many people punch out of the Christian life because they think it ought to be like McDonald's hamburgers. You order, bam, it's there. <laughs> and, 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 and yet the spiritual life involves waiting, much waiting. But in meantime, you keep planning. You, you'll reap in due time if you don't lose heart. I have seen, I have observed so many people that have hopped into the Christian life and hopped out of it. Not really true believers that have hopped out because they have not seen immediate results. God, God is faithful to his word. The big need in the Christian life is for perseverance. He's always faithful. In due time, we'll reap. Uh, so even when I see no appearance of the harvest, I continue to plan. I do not quit. I write several things in my journal every day. So I do not forget. One of the things I write in my journal every day is the word perseverance and th this sentence. I cannot fail if I do not quit. We need perseverance, folks, in doing righteousness in this Christian life. We reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow. We reap later than we sow. Here, here's the fourth law. We reap to the degree that we sow. This is... Uh, what Jesus is teaching in the last part of verse 38, he says, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. He's saying by, by the standard of measure that you plant the seed, by that same measure, it will be measured back to you. If you plant a little bit of seed, you'll get a little bit of return. If you own 100 acres of land and you choose to plant on just one acre, you're going to get one acre of return. But if you plant on 100 acres, you're going to get a whole lot more by, because by your standard of measure of planting, it'll, it'll come back to you in return. What, what, what Jesus is saying here is that you're the one who will determine the degree of the harvest by the degree to which you plant. Uh, we will not all reap the same. Uh, some are going to reap a far greater harvest than others because they sowed bountifully in giving. And God will give back to them in accord with the measure that they gave. Uh, to put this in modern terms, if uh, you're stingy, God will be stingy. Uh, if you're generous, God will be generous in return. The, the law of degree, uh, it applies as well to the sowing of evil. The more evil is sown, the greater the harvest of oh, folks, the greater the harvest of suffering both in this world and in the world to come. We, we will be judged and dealt with by our deeds. Mark this down. Our deeds, what we do, are the seeds that will be harvested in eternity. This is, this is what Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 is saying. It says, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant hearts, you are storing up wrath. You are storing up, a, if you're planting evil seeds, you're storing up a harvest of wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of of the righteous judgment of God, when that circle joins up, who will render to every man according to his deeds, according to the seeds that he has planted. And, and to those who by perseverance in doing good, planting seeds of good for glory and honor and immortality, they will uh, inherit the harvest of eternal life. So there you go. Four laws of the harvest. They, we see them every day out in the natural. They, they are true in the spiritual. Uh, we reap... Uh, what we sow, more than we sow, later than we sow, to the degree that we sow. Now, I have been thinking a lot about this this week. And uh, the thought came to me that one of the great realities of life is that we cannot change the past. Uh, the past is indelibly etched into the annals of history uh, we can learn from it, but we cannot change it. And, and that's the way it is with sowing and reaping in your life that is past. You, you can't change the past harvest. Once the harvest is in, its quality and its quantity is set. Folks, that's reality. Um, 
Some of you are here today living with the very harvest uh, that you have sown. Uh, maybe you have sown seeds of indifference to God's word. Who needs it? I've, I've had midshipmen come to me and say, who needs that? Uh, who needs it? Uh, he, you know, indifferent to his, God's ways. And, and you have to eat then the bitter fruit of a derailed marriage, a divorce, or a, maybe a parent, a, a rebellious son or daughter, the loss of a job, rapidly declining health. Maybe you have sown the seeds of self-rule, self-will, self-gratification, self-fulfillment, and you're reaping now the harvest of no relationship with God or others. And the only relationship you have with, is with yourself, and it's not very pretty, and you are reaping depression, anger, and gratitude. Perhaps you've sown seeds of selfishness and you've never get a, given a dime to the advancement of God's kingdom and you are sensing you are reaping the harvest of a void and emptiness in your life and dissatisfaction with all that you've accumulated. What can you do about the past harvest? You can't do anything to change it, but you can ask forgiveness for it. Um, while you can't change the past harvest in terms of what has happened, you can, you can certainly ask forgiveness for the past. The price of planning a life of sin is a harvest of judgment. The wages of sin is death. The, the ultimate harvest of your sin and my sin is the sin, is the, is the judgment of an eternal hell separated from God forever. And here's what I want to tell you right now. I want to tell you the good news of this book. The good news is this that God could be many, many things, couldn't he? But I got to tell you, God is a giver. God is a giver. And he has given to us the ultimate gift wrapped up in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus. And, and, and here's why Jesus is God's greatest gift to us. When And you mark this down. When Jesus went to the cross, he reaped what you sowed. He reaped what I sowed. He reaped the harvest of God's wrath against our sin. All of the grapes of God's wrath against your sin and my sin were squeezed into a cup. And at the cross, Jesus Christ drained that cup dry. And you can be forever delivered from reaping that harvest in eternity if you will repent of your sins and come to him confess your sins, ask for his forgiveness. He will forgive you. Jesus loves you and wants to forgive you for a life of bad farming. At the cross, listen, here's what Jesus did. He stood in front of that train coming in a circle. He stood in front of that oncoming train of God's wrath against our sin, and he took the full force of it so we would not have to suffer for it. Jesus stood in front of of our judgment and stopped it on the tracks before it hit us. And if we repent, listen, and trust in Jesus, he can and will intercept the judgment that we deserve. And watch this, start us on a new course of life, of planting seeds of righteousness, a, a new circle of righteousness and, and an abundant harvest in eternity. But, but if you do not come to Christ, this is the warning part of this message. If you do not come to Christ, if you don't repent and bow your knee to Jesus Christ, there, you will reap what you have sown in your rejection of him. We're living in a day of absolutely amazing grace in which we are offered a deliverance from this harvest of, harvest of judgment to come. And the opportunity to start a new reality, a new life, a new circle. We, we can't change the past. We can receive forgiveness for it. And we can start a new life today, a new planting today. Perhaps the most practical and measurable application of this sowing and reaping principle, and again, this is all over the scripture, has to do with our money. We're going to talk about money. Um, for the rest of this message, I... I, you know, the Bible indicates that our money is like seed. It's like seed. And um, if I were to ask you the question, um, how are you doing with the planting of seed for eternity with the use of your money? 
what do you think you'd say? Um, for the rest of this message, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to read three passages of Scripture and then make a couple of comments, and then I'm going to ask a question at the end. Um, the three passages of Scripture are really a summary of God's promises of financial blessing. Uh, probably the most famous teaching in the New Testament on giving, Christian giving, the most exhaustive is in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 11. And here's what Paul says. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's the law of degree. And then he says, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Underline this, folks, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then it says, and God is able. You can underline that too. And God is able to make all all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed what, what is God doing here he's encouraging us to be to be givers and and then then it says this as it is written he, he scattered abroad this is being of God God scattered abroad he gave to the poor his righteousness endures forever. Notice right in the heart of this passage, which is the, the great instruction on giving, Paul, what Paul does here is he gives us the ultimate motivation for our giving should be this, that God has first given to us. Do you see what it says there? God, gave, he gave to the poor. You say, well, Bill, who are the poor? That's us. We're the poor. We're the poor in spirit. We're the ones who have absolutely zero to commend ourselves to God. And God has given to the poor, he has given his ultimate gift of Jesus so that we can be made right with God. The number one reason, folks, that we ought to be givers is that we've been given to. We, we are recipients of grace and therefore we ought to give grace. He goes on to say, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, he's going to give you stuff to give and he's going to give you bread to meet your needs, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness and you'll be enriched in everything for all liberality which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. What, what is he saying here? He's saying whoever sows sparingly is going to reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously is going to reap generously. You sow a little, you get a little, sow a lot, reap a lot. This, this is saying that, that God gave us Jesus and he promises to give back to us when we give so that we can give more. This, this passage is a dare for us to become generous givers. You, he, he's saying in this passage, you'll, if you give, you'll have everything that you need and you'll have enough to give to other people. It is a plain promise. If you need more seed, he'll give it to you. Uh, God, God will make you rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Now, here's another passage. Malachi, or as Perry Martini says, Malachi, the first Italian prophet, Malachi 3.10. Here's what Malachi says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Th this verse is talking to us about the starting point for giving. giving. Maybe Maybe you've never given before. You've never planted financial, spiritual seed for the advancement of the kingdom of God. This verse tells you where to start. It says, start with a tithe. Bring the whole tithe. You know what the word tithe means? It means 10%. 10%. And, and what the Lord is saying here is, is, if you want to be a godly giver, take the first 10% of what you earn off the top, put it in the storehouse, which corresponds to the local church, so that there may be food in my house, spiritual nourishment in my house for my people. 
If, if you've never given before, this is the, the place to get started. 10%. And did you notice it came with a little bit of encouragement? What does God say here? Bring, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. And God says, test me now in this. This is the only time in Scripture where God says, I dare you, test me in this, declares the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, if you do this, he's saying, I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God promises for those who plant the seed of a tide, a harvest, a meager one, no, an overflowing blessing till it overflows. You say, Bill, what will the blessing be? More money? Possibly. Uh, I would say most likely more money so that you can keep on giving. Um, but, but there's even more and greater blessing. Uh, God's blessings are often material, but the best blessings we have from God can't be measured with a pocket calculator. Uh, how does God reward his generous children? Uh, might be more money, <laughs> but answered prayer, uh, a deep inner joy, uh, new friendships, uh, more opportunities to give, new, a new revelation of God's truth and his power that's available in our lives, amazing miracles. How about a peace that surpasses understanding for that difficult problem that you're in right now? The, the point is that, that God promises to, to open the, the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing at the point of our obedience to this truth. Malachi 3.10 and 2 Corinthians 9 uh, seem to be summarized by this verse in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Let me read it again. This promise, this is a promise. Give and it shall be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, for by your standard of measure will be measured to you in return. Those are the three scriptures. Now here's my question. Okay, here's my question. Why, with these amazing promises on giving, do so many Christians keep their seed in the barn and fail to, to sow. Um, the most accurate statistic is that the average Christian churchgoer gives 2.56% of their income. And that's, that's, that means a lot of people don't give anything because that's the average of everything that's given divided by the number of people in church. Why would that be the case? In the light of these amazing promises, I, I can only surmise, as I was asking God, that it must be because we do not believe the Word of God or understand the grace of God. I, I write another two things in my journal every morning because I am so thick and I am so quick to forget. I write, truth, God's Word is true. I, I affirm to myself every morning, that the Bible is true, that it means what it says, and it says what it means. So if there is a promise in the Bible, I can trust it, I can go to the bank on it. Folks, we don't, we don't plant because we fear crop failure. I'm, I'm af afraid uh, to sow fearing that there, there'll be no return on my investment. And, and I would say this, it's natural to have those fears when we give up our money uh, for the advancement of the kingdom. But listen, the clouds of those doubts and fears are overcome by, by literally the sunshine of these promises in the Word of God. They dismiss the fog. We fear that God will not resupply us and uh, with all that we need to meet our needs and to continue giving. We hang on to our money, our time, our talents, our free. We hang on to a lot of stuff. And, and, and here's my question. What really are the chances of crop failure? The answer is right there in, in Luke 6, 38. What it, look carefully at what it says. Give, and it might be given to you. Is that what it says? Give, and it could be given to you. It's not what it says. It says give, 
and it will be given to you. There is a certain harvest. If you give, you will receive that from the Lord. People do not give because they do not believe the Bible. That's what we say we do, but do we really? And there's some, something else that people who do not give fail to believe. People fail to believe the number one message of the Bible, and that is the message of grace. Because of grace, because of the gift that I have been given. Here, here's something else that, that I have to remind myself every day, and I write it in my journal. Grace, I am doing better than I deserve because of the gift that I've been given. I have been given, if you're a Christian, you have been given the most indescribable gift that we do not deserve. And this gift is all of my motivation to give. Not for the stuff that I'm going to get, but because of the gift that I've been given. When Paul reached the end of all that he wanted to say about giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 15, the last verse of that chapter, Paul says something like this about Jesus Thank God for his indescribable gift. I, and, and I think what he means to say is this. You know, the gift of Jesus is indescribable. I think he means to say this. If I were to go to the bank and withdraw all my money and give it away, if I were to sell my car and give my money to the poor, if I were to give all the clothes off my back and the food off my table and give it to world missions, and if I were to give everything, and then at the end of it, if I would sell myself as someone else's slave, I wouldn't have even begun to approach what God gave when, when he gave his only begotten son. God can never owe me anything, and I can never outgive him. And folks, listen to me. When, when I come to the end of all my philanthropy and I begin to pat myself on the back for being such a wonderful person because I give so much, God bids me to look at the cross and see his bleeding son. And then I realize I know nothing of what real giving is. Jesus is, is God's indescribable gift, and anything that I do pales in insignificance by comparison. And because of that, therefore, I will not hold back. I will not be stingy. I will be a generous giver to the... If God really did so love the world that he gave his only begotten son, then, then I will follow him and I will give whatever I can. I can do no less. Why do people not give because they they do not believe the bible and they do not understand the grace of the lord jesus i watched uh, this week a video uh, that was produced about uh, the work of the gospel in the middle east and uh, part of it was about kurdistan iraq where uh, my son is serving as uh, the pastor of the international church there and it actually has footage of the hook the city where they're living um, but there is uh, in this video footage uh, of one of uh, the arab emirates and they were conducting an interview with a, a christian filipino driver who was in a church there and they showed in the video a huge building that had been uh, savagely burned out where Many people had lived. The building was, was destroyed. People were displaced. Uh, they were desperately in need of food and clothing. And this, this Christian man um, went into the situation with his church uh, to give food and clothing to help people uh, who'd been displaced by the fire. And uh, after a while, one of the people came up to this man and said, why, why are you doing this? And, and he, his answer was simple. He, he said, we are the recipients of grace, and therefore we give grace. Uh, I have been given grace, and because I've been given grace, I give grace. I, I've been given what I don't deserve, and so I'm moved to give others the same kind of grace. And then this driver <laughs> said to that person, um, God has saved you from this fire, but there is another fire that's coming. 
and it's the fire of God's eternal wrath and hell against our sin, there is a, a fire of God's judgment coming for those who plant evil and disobey. But God has made a way for you to be saved from that fire as well. And it's only one way to escape the wrath of God that is to come, and that is through the grace of our Lord Jesus. It was true for that woman who asked the question. It's true for us. Um, this man, this Filipino cab driver, became a gracious giver because he believed the Bible and he embraced the Bible's number one message, the grace of the Lord Jesus. I wonder uh, what might be holding you back from giving today. I pray that God will raise up generous givers in this place. Um, you know what would happen if we gave generously, willingly, and cheerfully? You know, you know what would happen? God would love it. He would love it. Because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Let's, he's given us so much. Let's make God happy. Amen? Let's pray. Father, how I pray, uh, as I prayed with Barbara before this service, that we would not be merely hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Lord, that you would take this truth that is uh, so clear and that we would be responsive to it uh, with faith and obedience. Lord, I, I pray Lord, for those that are just hanging right on the edge and ready to take this jump into the pool of a lifestyle of giving, who, who might be afraid, Lord, would you please overcome the fear? And Lord, would you bless them with the overflowing uh, windows of heaven opened uh, as people take that step to give? Lord, uh, we also want to be forgivers and givers of, uh, Lord, help us to live this life of heaven on this planet. And for your glory, Lord, we want you to smile. We want you to uh, uh, love us because we're cheerful. Well, you don't love us because we're cheerful givers. You love us anyway, but we just want you to be happy, Lord, in Jesus' name.